Good evening, brethren. I'd like for you to think with me tonight about the righteousness of God. In Romans 1 and verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Oh, brethren, in the gospel, God has revealed his way to justify sinful, wicked, filthy, abominable, corrupted, polluted rebels. God has found a way to redeem them, and he did it in a just way. Amen. Oh, praise God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. In other words, those who embrace the gospel, they're changed by it. It is the power of God unto salvation. Any message claiming to be the gospel should be judged by whether it's accompanied with power or not. But the true gospel does change people, doesn't it? Amen. I'm looking at the power of God in front of me. Amen. He's made you righteous in Christ Jesus. Amen. So I want to think about the righteousness of God. In this gospel of power, well, first of all, to the Thessalonians, you know what Paul said to them? Our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in, the, in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. So it wasn't just about words. We didn't just talk people into this thing. It is the power of God because it's accompanied with heaven's power. And that's the gospel I'm interested in. In this gospel, what is revealed? The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. There are two things here I want to talk about. One is God's attribute of righteousness. And that is to the, say that the gospel shows that redeeming man was done in a righteous way. Every demand of justice was met and no one on earth or in heaven can lay any charge to God's elect. Amen. It is God that justifieth. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Amen. The second thing I want to think about the righteousness of God is that righteousness coming from God and imputed to us on account of Christ's atoning work. That is described as the righteousness of God here. From faith to faith. You receive it by faith and you walk in it and live by faith. This righteousness of God imputed to you. And the gospel displays both. Amen. The way that God saved us shows his righteousness. Amen. And the imputation of righteousness to us shows his love and mercy. Amen. We learn a lot about God by thinking about this simple phrase, the righteousness of God. Amen. How prophetic was Psalm 85.10? When it said, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That is, mercy was able to be extended to man in a way that didn't compromise God's truth. And peace was able to be extended to us in a righteous way. Amen. So first of all, let's think about the attribute of God's righteousness. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. You know that God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. But God is able to forget your sin and still be righteous in it. Amen. He is a righteous forgetter. He forgets your sin in a righteous way. 
I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Well, we know this very well and it's familiar to us, but there was a time when this was a great mystery. The forgiveness of sin, how could God forgive sin? Could he just make like an executive order and just cancel sin? He could not do it. Sin had to be dealt with because God is righteous. When God appeared before Moses, he proclaimed his name before him and he said, I will by no means clear the guilty. And we were all guilty. People have asked, is it right that God should send people to hell? But a better question would be, is it right that God should save anyone? Could he really save anyone? How can he forgive sin? He's a righteous God. He's his and Jesus, the throne of his kingdom. It's a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. It's established on righteousness. It's executed with righteousness. His kingdom is a right kingdom. Everything that is righteous will be done by God and Jesus Christ. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Nothing unrighteous comes from the throne of God. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. He is. And I want to suggest to you that this righteousness of God is an overriding, overriding attribute of God. He does all his works in righteousness. All his ways are righteous. See, this governs everything he does. It's governed by righteousness. And let me illustrate this to you by asking, could God be righteous without being merciful? Well, remember the angels that kept not their first estate? They're they're reserved in everlasting chains of darkness. And the people of Noah's day, God executed righteous judgment. And in the end of the world, there will be a righteous judgment against wickedness. But let me ask you, could he be merciful without being righteous? No, it's not possible. He's righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. His righteousness governs all of his attributes. He even said if, if to the judges in Israel, if there's a controversy, he said, you are to justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. He said, he that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. Solomon said, yes, this was what Solomon said, an abomination to the Lord to justify the wicked. But what did God say he was going to do? <laughs> him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. God said this is an abomination to justify the ungodly, but he said, I'm going to do it. Amen. Amen. We are justified, brethren, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. This is the way God has set forth Jesus to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The offering of Jesus Christ is the way that God can justify the ungodly in a just way. The gospel reveals that God is a just justifier. And this is no trivial matter, brethren. 
This was no trivial thing, what God did. And oh, the great price. The price tag on this was immense. God gave his own son. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. By his stripes we are healed and God made him to be sin who knew no sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So that's God's attribute of righteousness. Now think with me about Imputed righteousness. This is where God, it's called the righteousness of God because it comes from God. God provides it and he imputes it on those who believe. Amen. Isn't that a good deal? Amen. Anybody want that deal? Yeah. Imputed righteousness. Yeah. It's the righteousness he gives. It's, it's referred to as counted. We're counted righteous or it's reckoned or imputed to all who believe. It's given as a gift, and its imputation makes us righteous. It does. It makes us righteous, brethren. Of course, this is only in Christ Jesus. We are made the righteousness of God in Him. So in Him... Brethren, you are made righteous. I want to think about imputed righteousness in several ways. First of all, back at the beginning, no, before the beginning, we were chosen to be righteous. Amen. So this is God's purpose before the first work of creation began. Before, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ephesians 1, 4 says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Amen. 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 So this is God's purpose. No earth, no heavens, no stars, no, no people. And God said, I want people to be righteous, holy, to stand right before me. Right before me, in holiness, in love, because perfect love casts out fear. So he wants us, you know, I mean, God knew that man would fall. God knew that after he created man in his own image, without blame before him at that point, that man would quickly fall in sin. Knowing all this, before the first work of creation, God chose to redeem us in his son. To bring us back into a state of righteousness before him. Holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now brethren, I have to tell you, that's not a very comfortable place if you're not redeemed. Or if you don't have strong faith. Because in the presence of God, people quake and fear. They quake. They're going to call for the rocks and stones to fall on them, to hide them from the face of the, ram, of the Lamb. On the day that God appeared to Israel in Sinai, there was a thunder and smoke and the mountains shook and there was a trumpet blast sounding louder and louder and the people said, Stop it! No! Don't talk to us, God, or we'll die. And God said He wants you to be right there in front of Him holy and without blame before him in love. Well, you can tell this is not something we're going to achieve in ourselves. You can tell this is the work of God in the gospel. This is a righteousness of God revealed in the gospel that will be imputed to you so much so that you can stand in his presence, holy and without blame before him. And that's not all. Like Paul said to the Thessalonians, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as ye do, we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. 
So he's, he's working to this end to make you unblameable in God's presence so that you can have confidence in the day of judgment. Like it says in 1 John, because as he is, so are we in this world. He's making us righteous so we can stand before him. And brethren, when you've been made righteous, this is, this is the place you want to be, Amen. in God's presence. Amen. So he has chosen us to be righteous. We came from the putrid, rotting cesspool of sin and corruption, but God has chosen us to be holy and without blame before him in love. And so imputed righteousness means he's counted us righteous. We're counted righteous. The first time the word righteousness is used in the Bible is when God speaks to Abraham and he says he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Amen. Righteousness imputed to Abraham in exchange for his faith. Amen. This this phrase, this same verse is quoted four times in the New Testament, twice in Romans and Galatians and James. The, the word for imputed is used 11 times in Romans 4 alone. Does that make you want to go read Rem, Romans 4 again? It's translated, reckoned, counted, imputed, and accounted. Well, what, what, let's learn a little more about imputed righteousness. What did Abraham do so that God counted him righteous? Romans 4.20 says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Not, now it was not written for his sake alone, brethren, Amen. that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So believing is the main thing. You are going to stand before God one day to be holy and without blame before him, you need faith. Amen. So it says that he's chosen us to be righteous. He's counted us righteous. It also says he gave us righteousness. So now we're thinking of righteousness of God like a possession. In Romans 5, it says this, verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. I like that. The gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. That's the best gift you've ever been given. Amen. The gift of righteousness. You didn't earn it. God gives it as a gift to those who believe. Amen. And then also, it's not only that he counted us righteous, and gave us righteousness, he made us righteous. Now don't forget this part. It says this in Romans 5, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now Adam sinned, and all the human race had that, that, that line of sin in their veins. But in Christ Jesus, all Jesus' children have righteousness in their veins. We are made righteous. But that's not the only place. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him made the righteousness of God in him. God is making something new in a born-again person. Amen. He is making a new man that is righteous. Amen. And then, of course, this imputed righteousness is only in Jesus Christ. So when I think of the righteousness of God, I think of Jesus. I think of Jesus. 
surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. And what, na what name does he have? The Lord our righteousness. That's his name. He is our righteousness. Amen. Amen. I wouldn't want any other. I wouldn't want to exchange that for anything I've done. Our righteousness are as filthy rags. But we actually have the righteousness of God imputed to us. And we are made righteous in him. Now let's think a little bit about the nature of imputed righteousness. First of all, it's not my own. These are some obvious things, but they blessed me, brethren, just to think about them further. Paul said not, I want to be found in him. I want to be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. But that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's the righteousness I want. Amen. It's not my own. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. His righteousness. Amen. I'm not seeking my own. I'm seeking his righteousness. <laughs> In fact, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. 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 Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So God is able to impute righteousness because he's not going to impute sin to us. So now, thinking about the righteousness of God, he's imputed righteousness to us. He's not imputing our sin. That means he had to impute our sin to Christ. Amen. Right. He made him to be sin. Yes. Praise our Savior. Amen. Another thing about imputed righteousness is that it is true righteousness. Amen. There's no such thing as partial righteousness, is there? No. It's like my shirt is partially clean. It's dirty. <laughs> Righteousness means there's no flaw, no shadow of turning. How does the color white sound to you, brethren? Uh, you better get used to it. <laughs> Come now, let us reason together. God said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Daniel said, many shall be purified and made white. Amen. Oh, purge me with hyssop, David said, and, and I shall be clean. Wash me. I shall be whiter than snow. Even talk about going to the throne of grace to obtain mercy, to help in time of need. David had sinned greatly. And yet he has the audacity, the we should say the faith to go to God and say, if you wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. My sin will be gone. That's faith, brethren. Amen. Well, John was given on the Isle of Patmos, maybe, ex maybe exiled by himself, but he was given to see a great multitude, and, which no man could number. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. White robes. Well, who are these which are arrayed in white robes? Robes. And whence came they? He said, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So that's the way God makes us white, is the blood of the lamb. White robes. Think about it, brethren. The lamb's wife, the wife 
was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. It's their righteousness now. It was given to them. It's theirs now. It's counted to them. White. Praise God. Think of the contrast in Revelation 19. Here you see the Son of God sitting on a white horse. And it says that his vesture is dipped in blood. So now he's, he's on this white horse and his garments are red with blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fly, fine linen, white and clean. The Son of God in red, the rest of us in white. Oh, praise God. What a contrast. That's why he's as a lamb that had been slain. Now also, righteousness is not just a covering. Joshua, the high priest, Zechariah was given to see Joshua, the high priest, standing before the Lord. And he says that Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Stood before the angel, filthy garments. Not just spotted, filthy. And he answered and spake unto those that stood by him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. Take them away. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. God didn't just cover up his filthy garments. He took them away. Amen. Brethren, your sin has been taken away. Amen. If you believe in Jesus Christ, your sin that Satan likes to try and remind you of, it's been taken away. You know what? I had filthy garments too. Filthy garments. And he took my garments away. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. Filthiness. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Isaiah said, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And God looks at us, in your faith, he says, take away his iniquity. Amen. Take it away. I'm not going to put my righteousness as a covering over sin, I'm going to take sin away and then put righteousness on you. So if he takes it away, what happened to the sin? I have blotted out as a thick cloud, he said, your transgressions and as a cloud thy sins return unto me for I have redeemed thee. He blotted them out. And at this time, it wasn't altogether clear how he was going to do that. But we know, brethren, who is a God like unto thee, Micah said, that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will com have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So you have a, a besetting sin that's giving you trouble. Call, let's call on God to subdue our iniquities. Amen. Subdue it, God. Take it out of me. Amen. It's not appropriate for a saint Amen. to be sinful. Amen. So he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In Hebrews chapter 9. And Daniel said that 70 weeks are determined. When he was going to finish the transgression. Listen to all the ways that he says the same thing here. Finish the transgression. 
make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. The righteousness of God, brethren. He brought it in. Now this, uh, I don't know if you've considered much about the relationship of the righteousness of God imputed to you and the new man that God has created in you. But I think they're strongly related. Paul said to put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, what? Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This, this thing that God has created in you is just like God in righteousness and true holiness. It's not a fake holiness. It's not just a covering. It is true righteousness. This new man in you. So let's think for a minute then about the effect of righteousness. Isaiah talked about the work of righteousness and the effect of righteousness. That's what I want to think about. The effect of righteousness. What, like what happens when God imputes righteousness to someone? Does anything happen? Could we tell? Does God see us as righteous or does he make us righteous? Well, both. <laughs> Amen. Think about Isaiah 61. Now he talked about a robe here. The imagery God used here. It's Isaiah 61, I'm going to read from verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So it's pictured as a robe, like a it covers you. The righteousness of God. But let's read on. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it, sown in it, to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Then he said, For Zion's sake I will not keep hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness. And the salvation thereof is a lamp that burneth. So now we see two pictures here. One is the robe of righteousness and the other is the planting of a seed. It's going to spring forth. God plants a seed of righteousness in you. Not only does he cover you with a robe, he plants a seed of righteousness in you. It's a covering and a planting. So let the priest be clothed with righteousness. David said. And those that God has given beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And he says that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So when someone is born again, God does some planting. It's not just... I don't see your sin anymore. He made you righteous, and he's planting righteousness in you. Oh, brethren, it's going to spring forth. God has determined it so. He's chosen you for this purpose. So whosoever is born of God sinneth not, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Amen. He puts a holy seed in you that cannot sin. Amen. We are born of, again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And we are filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. The fruits of righteousness comes from the seed of righteousness that he planted in us. 
So not only does he impute righteousness to us, he plants righteousness in us. And that grows. We see that, brethren. You see, when someone is walking with the Lord and is justified by grace, God makes their life different. Righteousness starts to spring up. They start to be different. The things they used to love, they don't love them anymore. They start hating sin. They start loving righteousness. They want to be in the Word of God. They want to be with the brethren. There is righteousness at work within them. So shall we continue in sin? God forbid. Jesus said, I'm come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. That's the whole idea. Take you out of darkness and put you into light. Don't be deceived by a false gospel that lets you stay in the darkness. That's right. That's right. It's, it subverts the whole purpose of God in salvation. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. So in his simple way, John said, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. It's the evidence. Now, we've got a lot of work to do, I'll confess, brethren. But uh, that new man within you, it cannot sin. It's born of God. It's created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, I know if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you eat through the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body, mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So the power of the gospel is a new creature. What, look what God hath wrought. All our works are wrought of him. He has put within us the ability to be righteous. So walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I just, in closing, I just want to remind you, brethren, that this is all is brought to us by faith. It's from faith to faith. We receive it by faith and we live and continue in it by faith. The just are not only saved by faith, but they live by faith. So God is righteous. His salvation is righteous. And because of Jesus, he counts us righteous. And he makes us righteous. Praise God for his mercy to us.